wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, featuring your hosts, Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Julie Tenner. And I'm Bridget Wood. And today we're talking about princess archetypes. But before we get on to that, I just want to jump in and tell you a bit about the retreat, which we've just launched. It's coming up on the 8th of November, and it's really for the women who have been like us at some point in their mothering journey or in their career journey, where they've found that they perhaps have lost themselves by degrees, or they're really feeling like that they've got out of touch with what they're really here to do, um, and falling back in love with the life that they've got and the, the families that they've built and, and the career or job that they have. And it's really about creating a space to just awaken that soul purpose that you're here to do and really nourish who you are and reconnect with that, you know, to give yourself permission to have a space to go in, in deep into yourself and be surrounded by a community of inspiring women who are on that same journey with you. So we'd love to invite you um, to join us on that. Um, you can find out more on our Facebook page, but let's get stuck in today's podcast. Sure. So I really, last week we interviewed Elle Griffin and she really walked us through historical, biblical, archetypes and Bridget and I were discussing wow was bringing up so much for us around what a feminine archetype is and Mm. the exploration of the divine feminine and that's all coming up for us because we're really looking at how we're going to explore that in our retreat yes and so Bridget said it's so confronting because we're talking about Disney princesses that have such a background to them of um, certainly in the natural parenting community of being quite a negative influence for young girls or young women yeah so today we really wanted to pull those apart and I really wanted to bring in a bit of um, storytelling and narrative around those stories and see if we can really find a more balanced viewpoint on what they have to offer us and our daughters. So I want to start with maybe just talking about the archetype because we didn't really set that in place last week and I want anyone who's not sure what that means to really understand that an archetype is just a set of characteristics that are universally universally attributed to that person. So the way they look, the way they act, the way they speak. So if I say queen, king, mermaid or witch, there's a certain list of attributes that we can all kind of conjure in our head that describes this type of person. And that's really what an archetype is. It's a traditional or universal description of different types of characters, which we can embody, we can call upon, or we can certainly use to influence ourself to further our development by taking in parts of those characteristics. So I'm just going to start with a quote from the book Women Who Run With The Wolves, which if you're interested in pulling apart our history as women through stories, is a really fantastic book for you to read. And certainly she talks a lot about how to read our dreams as well. So this is one I'm going to focus on specifically for this podcast. And here it goes. The problem with being too good, in inverted commas is that to the extreme, it does not resolve the underlying shadow issue. And again, it will rise like a tsunami, like a giant tidal wave, and rush down, destroying everything in its path. In being too good, a woman closes her eyes to everything distorted or damaging around her, and just tries to live with it. Her attempts to accept their abnormal state further injure her instincts to react, to point out, to change, to make impact on what is not right and what is too just. So the first part, um, and this author really describes the first part in any of the stories and fairy tales that we grow up with, is to some extent she's bringing in this crone archetype. So this too good mother, which we could relate to the Virgin Mary, this Mm. too good woman um, that all fairy tales start off with. They always start off with this really beautiful maiden, which is another archetype of Mm. the feminine. So the three main archetypes of the divine feminine are the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And they all represent something a little bit different. So the maiden is your really naive, too good, too beautiful, too precious, sheltered woman, Mm. usually young. And the mother then has gone through a rite of passage and has a slightly different point of view, but still is very much protective and mothering and nurturing, and sometimes to the extreme. So too too mothering and too nurturing then has an impact on the soul. Overprotective. Yes. Because again, still, if you're in that space, then you've got to think all of these are archetypes within our one soul. Mm -hmm. So if our mother is still mothering our naive 
child or daughter or whoever we are, they're never going to grow up. They never get to experience the Mm. world. And it's through those deep, dark moments that we really come into our light and our being and find out who we are and what we're made of. So in steps the crone or the witch or the dark perpetrator of some sort in any of those stories and within our dreams. And her purpose there really is what um, this author refers to as a life death life cycle so her version is to take the life that is so the the um, naive maiden generally is what happens in our fairy tales and she casts her out in some way that she must enter the deep dark forest and she must meet her maker and meet the devils and go through almost a heroine's journey of the rite of passage to get back in touch with her wild woman self her instinctual self Mm. to learn the lessons of valuing who she is and seeing what she sees and really hearing what she hears and having the courage like a wolf mother to be instinctual enough to react, to not be duped, which is often what the too good yeah. princess is. Yeah. So when we look at the divine feminine, that's really the three main archetypes. And there's loads more that we can bring in and be relational too. But in most fairy tales, they are the general archetypes that are in there. And in a fairy tale, whenever we're talking about even masculine archetypes, so the prince, the king, and even a male perpetrator or predator of some sort, they are all still representative as spectrums of that female psyche. So the female psyche still has as- uh, aspects of the masculine within it. So I'm going to read you another quote from this book, which is talking about the rites of initiation or the rites of passage that a woman goes through when she's moving through these stages in her life. So the first task, allowing the too good mother to die. The psychic tasks of this stage in a woman's life are these, accepting that the ever watchful, hovering, protective psychic mother is not adequate as a central guide for one's future instinctual life, and therefore the too good mother dies. Taking on the task of being on one's own, developing one's own consciousness about danger, intrigue and politic, becoming alert by oneself for oneself, letting die what must die as the too good mother dies, the new woman is born. When a woman's instinctual nature is strong, she intuitively recognises the innate predator by scent, sight and hearing, anticipates its presence he is at approaching and takes steps to turn away. In the instinct injured woman, the predator is upon her before she registers its presence, for her listening, her knowing and her apprehension are impaired, mainly by interjects which exhaust, exhort her to be nice, to behave and especially to be blind to being misused. Though there be injury if a woman is captured and or tricked into remaining naive and compliant, there is still left adequate energy to overcome the captor, to evade it, to outrun it, and eventually to sunder and render it for their own constructive use. So I find all of this really um, influential in terms of talking about well, one, the rites of passage, one, getting back in touch with the divine feminine, but also this concept of the instinct injured woman, which Mm. is where I see so many of our women friends of our daughters sitting is how do you teach your daughter to be compliant and nice and kind and good, but also offer her the path and the tools to being instinctual. So she has the ability to self-protect, to know the predator Mm. and to have the resources and the strength to evade that. To me, it comes back to intuition. And unfortunately, it's one of those things which we have lost, you know, over time, you know, all of us have in, in the kind of society that we live in, the culture we live in, that's that disconnection, you know, when, when, yes, you, when you're in, in a place of disconnection with yourself, then it's much more tricky to awaken intuition. You know, what's intuition versus fear, you know, and a lot of people sit in a, in a fearful, um, state of mind. And that's also, that's kind of, kind of what births that mother who is overprotective because everything is to be feared, mm. which is then projected onto the child, which then creates a child who is anxious and, you well, know. Well, who continues to stay naive, if, yes. if that is the case. There's no there's no strength out of adversity in that because there never is adversity. Yes. It's constantly going it's, to be avoided. It's that whole cotton wool concept. Mm. So this book, Women, Running, Women Who Run With The Wolves, really talks about, it's really, the whole book is about the wild woman archetype. Mm. And the wild woman literally represents the instinctual woman. So what are the, what is the special of the instinctual woman, where historically has she sat and been revered and what's happened in our culture that we've moved away from it and hence become instinct injured. 
So um, that's all hugely interesting. I really wanted to sit with that first so that we really understood what I was talking about when I look at these stories as being representative of these life cycles in a woman's psyche mm. so that we could really sit in a place with that when we were looking at it. So I think we might start with The Little Mermaid because that's what I've got first here on my notes. So The Little Mermaid really can be deconstructed as a story if you're really wanting to look at a positive out of it, which is she puts herself outside her comfort zone to really experience life and love. Water traditionally is a symbol for the feminine subconscious. And not only is she living in a body of water, so living in the divine feminine, but she's Mm. living really deep in it, in a place that's so mysterious we don't know about in the real world. So it's really that call, which you'll see in so many traditional storytelling of a woman diving deep beneath the waters and living and surviving, really coming back home to her nature, her instinctual nature, nurture place. Mm. That's really what that deep, spiritual, mysterious, mystical place is. So I really look at The Little Mermaid as one being at the point being born into a body of the feminine where she's able to really sit in where she's come from and who she is. And, and she, even even the visual representation of her character with having yes. the volup, you know, the huge... She's very sensual. Re- and the, the red hair, you know, yes. the choice of giving her red hair, you know, which yeah, has such true. connotations, doesn't it, in terms of, you know, the fiery feminine. Yeah, it's really true. And, and it's that feminine strength. Totally true. This is what I love looking at it for. So in the end, she strikes a really painful bargain with the witch, which obviously is representative of the crone. So these are all... You've got to look at these as all aspects of her or the or the, in the story, this one woman's side. Mm. So she's the too good, naive maiden in the story. Yes. And she knows that there's something she, she knows she's not supposed to. She's supposed to be a good girl and stay under the water and not mm. venture out. But there's something in her psyche that calls to her to Explore. enter the deep. Mm. Well, not really in this case, I suppose, isn't it? To resurface, to come back to her instinctual nature. There's something that's calling her to go a place she's not supposed to go. Mm. And she does. And she finds something really intriguing there that she wants to experience and knows that she can't if she stays connected to where she is now. So she chooses to disconnect. So she, in doing this, the crone offers her the opportunity to flicker out. So she literally tears her from her comfort zone, tears her, you know, her ability to survive where she is away from her and throws her into the deep end, into you know, um, her heroine's journey into a place that literally is physical world and she has to learn how to walk like an infant in the masculine. So the Mm. physical world is very much a representation of the masculine. She has to learn to walk like a babe. She doesn't even know how to do it. She has to find her way through the masculine. And this is the starting of her heroine's journey Mm. is how does she come from what she's known and what she's been into thrown into the other extreme of that. And she has to really go on a heron's journey, Mm. which is always going through the deep, dark forest or the trials and tribulations of that journey to get out of it, the the gold out of whatever that experience is. Mm. So she does. She enters the physical world. She learns to walk. And then there's the prince. So the prince in this archetype, as I've got to remember, is kind of like the naive maiden. So he's In his masculine, he's very easily duped, kind of like the, you know, the too good father or mother. The father in particular, the really the father um, archetype is very protective and physical, but unaware of the intuitive um, underpinnings, I suppose, of things that happen in the story. So Mm. he tends to not be present to a lot of those things. A little bit simplistic in Mm. a way. Mm. Yeah. So the prince is like, so the prince is, you know, duped by the witch, um, which here represents the devil or the underworld or the dark that seeks, seeks to keep the conscious under her control. So the two good naive maiden must die in order for her to find her strength and power and be who she, her, who her soul really calls her to be. And in the end, that's what happens. She goes through trials and tribulations. She and the masculine have learnt lessons and they work together and they overcome um, the witch and the crone, which essentially is the life death life cycle of the of the crone that she mm. really offers the maiden in that process, mm. and they marry, which is you know traditionally literally as we talked about even in last week's podcast in a sexual sense it's even just the union of the masculine and the feminine yeah. with you knowing, yes. so it's moving from being naive to a knowing woman. It's a really lovely symbolic overview of what that story represents. I love that, you know, because it really is, and perhaps in some ways that witch or the crone can be seen as a representation of her own shadow side, you know, because they are all all reflections of her that she's journeying. It's exactly right. That's what I really want you to look at with all of these stories is they're not actually individual characters. They're all part of the one psyche. Yes. And if something's out of balance or 
women need to get back in touch with their instinctual selves. And the only way to do that is through a journey and a life death life mm. cycle. And so the crone comes in almost as the baddie, mm. but always she's the one that saves the woman in the end because yes. of the baddie experience. Yes. She actually needed that. Yes. Well, as you explain that, I really thought it's really wise to come back to how you sit in your body when you're watching films and, you know, or any kind of um, program or any kind of re- reading books, anything any kind of media, I guess, that you're exposing yourself to because those stories and those archetypes and your reaction to those is such an insight into the things that you're working on within yourself. Like, cause I know I've watched films like that before and, you know, you're kind of sitting in that space in your body where you're going, don't do it, you know, don't, st- 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 you know, st- stay underwater, stay where you're safe. Stay as the naive maiden. Yes. And so that's actually an opportunity for you to reflect on yourself. Like, where are you doing that? You know, mm. in your own life, you know, what, what, what's that? Because it's a real opportunity for learning and growth, even in sitting, watching a kid's movie, yeah, you know, is. like I, I've, I still haven't watched The Lion King since I was 10 because I was so upset by it. <laughs> but there's really obviously some learning in there for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we could pull a lot in part two, we but could. let's stick with the princesses. Yes. So next I'm going to look at Rapunzel. So Rapunzel really out of that story, I think what you can gift your girls is that she really creatively thinks outside of the box. So creativity is really a, not necessarily just artistic creativity is the ability to think um, in different ways and, mm, and outside problem of the box. Solve. Yeah, problem solve mm. in many different ways, exactly. So we can look at what she's locked in a tower, which is really putting her on a pedestal, the pedestal maiden. She's really totally untouchable. She's completely perfect. She's too precious for the real world. And so the the representation there is that feminine wants to keep that. They want to protect her and keep her perfect. Mm. But ultimately that's never going to work. It's never going to happen because we all need to break free and move through yes. back to our instinctual wild woman selves. Mm. So she knows that she's yearning for more experience and it trots in in the way of this prince riding past and finding her. And that's part of, again, that masculine calling back to a physical sense and a journey and a heroine's path. And so he provides the impetus, I suppose, for her to want to be thrown out. And then we see the witch and the crone. So she forces the maiden to die in order to be reborn a new woman. So in that story, there's very much this omnipresent witch who, in a way, has tried to keep her trapped and safe, but in another way, has in doing that, has forced her out of that bubble to go on her own heroine's journey. Mm. Obviously, in the original fairy tale, she then is cast off and the prince becomes blind, and it's actually those journeys as their own... It's the journey of the masculine as well as the journey of the feminine moving from being naive to being knowing and instinctual, and Mm. then they marry up again, obviously, in the Disney version. Um, they go through trials and tribulations together and, um, the, that, that witch crone kind of presence is always, um, there to kind of keep her spurring on. She never really stops her. She just kind of gives her the impetus to, to keep moving forwards. Um, so then if we look at Pocahontas, which I actually really like, and even growing up, I remembered loving her story. What I love about that is that she really brings with her a lot of mysticism, a lot of intuition of ancient art. She even speaks to the tree of life or the tree of wisdom, which is even represented as the feminine in a water space. Mm-hmm. So you kind of think it's actually all these extraordinary themes, even in, even in the Disney version yeah. of that. So, and what I love about Pocahontas is that her whole journey is about paying attention to the details and paying attention attention to her intuition. And that's what her story is. In the end, the way that she saves herself, saves her love, saves the masculine, saves her tribe is through listening to her intuition and trusting that wild woman enough to know which path. She doesn't have to guess. She doesn't have to be told anymore. No one's controlling her. She knows where to go because she's reconnected with her instinctual self and moved Mm -hmm. through those rites of passage. So I actually really love that. Also, there's lots of animals and lots of princesses that talk to animals in those Disney versions. And animals really typically represent the wildish instinctual nature that we're communicating with. So I also love that in a lot of these Disney movies, there's so many animals and she's constantly talking to them and they're constantly her friends and they're helping her, which is such a guide for our intuition that Mm. when we choose to listen to it and communicate with it, it's always there, always there, Mm. helps us and guides Mm. us. Um, in Pocahontas, we've also see the father type who unknowingly, again, is keeping her in her maiden state because he wants to direct her life. He wants to keep her safe and he wants to choose the path that he believes is best for her and it should go. Mm. So um, there's love and there's union through connecting and listening to her intuition. The masculine and the feminine are one. 
um, and she's no longer naive and she's moved through that. Then at the very end of the Pocahontas, this is very interesting, very different to any of the other stories. At the end of Pocahontas, love leaves. The masculine takes a step away, which is also a really interesting storytelling theme in that there's this presence of, of protect, protection, connection and um, love, but that it is at a distance. It's not in a physical proximity. And storytelling wise, traditionally, that was also a sign of now the knowing woman with her new knowledge and intuition and guiding points is ready for her next step, her next leap, her next mm. journey. And that's also what I think you're left with in Pocahontas is that you know, on one level, you're kind of sad that it's leaving, but another level, she's so empowered and so knowing in her state that you're completely happy for mm. her as a woman. She's so whole as yes. she is. Yeah. Mm. So really, I really love that about her story um, as well. So I'm just going to quickly move into Elsa because obviously she's so massive at the moment. And what I love about Elsa is that she really connects to her wildish nature from being too good and um, creates incredibly creatively creates incredibly beautiful spaces around her, which I love part of that is the wild woman archetype is the creativity is hugely important. And we are doing another a podcast on that one. Mm. So we see again here, the father mother archetypes that are see seeking to really keep the maiden asleep and ignoring her wildish instinctual nature. They want her to stay too good. They even fear what that wildish nature unleashed would be, which again is really interesting themes for me. So um, they choose instead to really dull her, to get her to conform, to let go of her creative and instinctual side, which of course she can't. So at some point she can't stand it anymore. She can't stay like this and she knows that the naive may, the, that she must journey through that. And so what we see in this story is that then we have Anna, her sister, who represents a really naive maiden, more naive even than Elsa is. And she, what ends up um, hitting Elsa's journey onto another path is that this really naive maiden steps in with this um, masculine who she can't even register the danger that's in him, the manipulation or the whatever, mm. because she's so naive. And for some reason, Elsa, probably a little bit more connected to her wildish nature, can sense that it's not right. Even on a basic level, she's like, no way. And this actually triggers her then onto her journey. And so she obviously leaves. And what I love is that in that, you know, that song that everybody sings and she's building her castle and it's so beautiful and so creative, she is becoming very much back to her wildish nature. She becomes sexy. She gets very sultry. She's very creatively and, and earthed. And um, I really love that wildish side, that really, mm. you know, instinctual side that comes along. And with that comes passion and laughter and back in touch with all of her sensual female journey again. So then we see um, that the community then rally against that version of the woman and they come chasing her down. And ultimately she gets knocked out. So representatively in fairy tales, when a woman enters slumber, she's in a, either she's asleep from what's happening around her and she's in the very naive state, or it can be representative of she's in the underworld journey. So she's journeying some really deep dark stuff and she's trying to reconcile within her psyche where that fits so that the new mm. woman can be reborn. In either case, Elsa is knocked out. Then ultimately we see the naive maiden dies and freezes and the awakened instinctual knowing woman is given life through love and connection and gratitude for the wild. And the tears mark this sacred connection. So tears are also historically in storytelling seen as holy water, as healing, as nourishing, and um, certainly a way for, that the devil can't even accept tears. So tears have always been even a sacred circle space. So I actually really love all of those aspects in the Elsa wild woman kind of story, if we can look at it that way. Mm. I also really love Snow White. So Snow White for me really is about sharing our gifts with this world. And Snow White's gifts really are to help and love those around her for exactly who they are without any judgment. So again, we have the theme of the maiden and the crone who wants her death and employs the masculine, who again is unseeing and unknowing. But instead of causing her death, he sends her fleeing into the forest. And the forest is always representative of the underworld and the deep psyche as well. Mm. So she has to face the devil. She has to get through the, the really scary stuff to find the gold. And when all seems lost, the maiden finds safety with a multifaceted version of the masculine. So she's got seven little dwarfs, seven versions of the masculine and all who she spends time with, she lives with, she learns from mm -hmm. and she nurtures, which is fascinating. 
So she becomes safe again, and again, we see this theme of the crone coming up. So again, she's a bit too safe. She's staying there too long. She's not going on her journey. So mm. the crone comes in again, mm. and the crone really pushes her back again into the life-death life cycle because she needs to let go of some stuff so that she can really move to where she needs to be. And we see the apple. Now, the apple is really interesting, and I'm going to read another quote from the... Um, Women Who Run With The Wolves book, because she talks a lot in this about apples, and I actually really love this particular quote. The apple tree and the maiden are interchangeable symbol, symbols of the feminine self, and the fruit a symbol of nourishment and maturation of our knowledge of that self. If our knowledge about the ways of our own soul is immature, we cannot be nourished from it, for the knowing is not yet ripe. As with apples, it takes time for maturation. The roots must find their ground, and at least a season must pass, sometimes several. If the maiden soul sense, sense remains untested, nothing more can occur in our lives. But if we get, but if we gain underworld roots, we can become mature, nourishing the soul, self, and psyche. So I really love this whole concept about the apple really being an interchangeable symbol with the maiden. So it's fascinating to me that the crone offers her an apple to bite that really is poison, poison to her soul, mm. which in itself I find really fascinating. So she can't resist it. And that, again, is really interesting that there's something in that, again, crone offering of here's your next journey, but it's scary and it's big and it's deep. Mm. Do you want to bite into it? Yeah. She can't resist it. She does. She bites it and she falls asleep. And she's seeming dead. So again, this is another theme of she's in the underworld. She's processing and reconciling mm. what's going on. And she's assumed dead to everyone around her, which is again, really, so the masculine around her sees her as dead, which is really fascinating mm. as well, because she no longer represents the maiden. The yes. maiden died and she's reconciling who she now is. Mm. Um, so it's also what we often see, the death time of solitude to reorder all that's learnt and so that they can be born again. Then we have the prince who comes trotting in and he sees this woman lying there who's been through this death cycle and he falls instantly in love with her. And he kisses her and we see the union of the new knowing woman and the new knowing masculine coming together and riding off for a happily ever after, mm. which again is a beautiful representation of the feminine journeying the heroine's journey yeah and really the masculine is not the prince in the white chariot running in to save her it's her representation of the masculine and the uniting of those yes. two aspects within her psyche mm. which i think then completely shifts the way that we can look at those stories rather than being they being simply that the, the, you know the kind of the vulnerable woman needs saving the white knight syndrome yeah. it's not that at all no, it's, it's the much woman. more complex and yes. rich, richer than that isn't it yes and the woman saves herself ultimately and the mm. prince is just representative of of the masculine Masculine version, and also the transition that she's made to yes. to awaken that part of herself, and therefore ultimately get what she in the end desired. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So the last one I thought we'd touch on would be Sleeping Beauty. So for me, Sleeping Beauty is all about seeking your soul's purpose and really working bravely to live that. So the maiden again, we see she's too good, she's too perfect, and too naive. We have three good fairies. Three is really interesting because three comes up a lot in wishes, in in stories, in mm. you know fables and three really is representative of um try once it doesn't work try twice and for some reason it doesn't quite hit the nail on the head but three times that third time mm. sweet that's where it happens so we see that the third fairy comes to cast her spell on this child or her her um wish or her gift to this child but gets stopped by the witch which mm. is the crone yes. which is again really interesting and the crone speaks in this tone and says um, she will be drawn into a death and there's nothing you can do to stop it, which is interesting because she's again talking about the maiden and the, mm. and the two pure self absolutely having to go on that journey. There's yeah. no way that she can't. Yeah. And then the third fairy comes in and goes, okay, well, she's not really going to die, but she'll be able to live with it in some way. Right. Yeah. And so um, then we see the mother and father are seeking to keep the maiden sleeping, you know, in a, in a sense. And so they send her to live in the forest, which is interesting because the forest is very much the subconscious as well. So they mm. want to keep her protected mm. and still too mothered and still too, too perfect but at the same time they sent her into the subconscious in a way and she's surrounded again by animals which again is her intuition so we understand that there's some point in that story that she's reconnecting with some of those wild woman intuitive mm. you know kind of pathways 
And funnily enough, in this story, it's the animals or her intuition or her deep knowing, whatever you want to call it, that lead her to the prince. So she doesn't find the prince. The prince doesn't happen upon her. Mm. Her guides yes. lead her to her fate. And the prince becomes a focal point for her um, rescuing herself in the end. So the masculine, again, we see is um, in the end lured by the crone. So the crone is is um, irresistible. The maiden dies and the journey into slumber and into the underworld. So again, she absolutely can't um, stop that journey of that spindle. She knows she has to seek it out. She doesn't know why. It's an unconscious driver, but she has to reach the edge of the forest, the dark point of the mm. woods, into that subconscious slumber because she knows it's her fate if she's ever going to come out the other side. And mm. she does. Mm. And she pricks her finger and she dies. The two good maiden dies because now, like Eve who ate the apple, she knows too much now. Yes. It's kind of this initiation into the knowing of the wild woman. Mm. And so she falls asleep. And then we see the prince gets duped by the crone. Again, this is very much the masculine, again, being too naive and too simplistic in, in the underworld knowings. Mm. And he then has to go on his hero's journey. So the masculine then has to grow up. So we see him fighting and, you know, getting out of all sorts of dangers and dramas and the dragon. And, you know, we could certainly talk about all of those um, symbology. And in the end, he fights through all of those he's grown up he's learned some lessons he's proved his love and his devotion to this new woman and he enters her space and he seals their union with a kiss and that's the connection and conjunction between truth and love the union of the human soul and the human spirit with the divine that's essentially what historically a kiss meant it's the union between the masculine and the feminine mm. and the union of that that creates the perfectness of of the divine so I feel like fairy tales never actually meant to disillusion young girls, but they're really meant as as tasters, as versions to inspire women or for, for young girls to know in their knowing that there's a journey for them, that mm. the dark stuff is always where the gold is and that they their journey ultimately has to be to shed those layers of the too good, too perfect, too pure, too beautiful, mm. to really become the rich, deep, inherent knowing Authentic woman. self. Yeah. Mm, mm. So that's my brief overview of the Disney princesses and why I'm not, you know, so anti them. Yeah. I <laughs> but that. I really want to hear uh, from you. I know certainly in natural parenting circles, there's a big um, negative taint on Disney versions. Yeah, there really is. And I think probably that's overlaid by my studies in media and communications and cultural theory and all of that kind of stuff, which... With a, with a bit of a feminist bent at the same time, which all sort of just seems to kind of you know, jar with the whole Disney princess um, theory. And I just love the way that, that these stories or this way interpretation that you have has really been able to um, unpack the, the beautiful journeys in that. And actually, it kind of rebalances this perception of sort of the the masculine sort of being much more kind of superior to the feminine, which is the way that a lot of people are interpreting these Disney stories, mm. you know, that the, that the woman always needs saving and that this poor girl, she's this damsel in distress kind of scenario. But in fact, you know, he's almost kind of happening in the background while she's on this amazing journey of awakening, mm. which is really he what always they all features are. Because the masculine always has to feature with the feminine. Yeah. But he's got to go on a journey and she's got to go on a journey before they both become known mm. and they reach somewhere in the middle. I think a lot of people get really charged by the idea too about, um, you know, the happily ever after, you know, mm. and people, you know, that say that that never happens, you know, where's my happily ever after, you know, it's just all, it's all a story. Mm. But perhaps that's, perhaps that's because the happily ever after comes after the hard stuff. You know, well, it, does it comes complain. after the work. Yes, it does. But also, like in Pocahontas, it never actually ends. No. So there's constantly... A story, ha a story has to end somewhere. So that's kind of, you know... That's right. It is. which they've chosen to end it. Yes, but... it is. Except in Pocahontas. Mm. When there you see there's there's another part to the story and you see that the journey just continues. It never actually ends. So, yeah, but I, t I do really understand that happily ever after concept. But I think it's about shifting that to our personal happily ever after as opposed to our union with um, another person creates our happily ever after yeah, yeah. that's not what these stories designed to tell young no. girls these stories designed to say when you reconcile within yourself mm -hmm. for yourself on your own with your intuition and your wild woman and all of your archetypes mm -hmm. feeding what you need to be fed at any given moment that's when you are whole and you have a happily ever after because mm -hmm. then you are reconciled as a, a true authentic woman Being, yeah. living in your soul's purpose mm. in a very grounded way. It's not meant to be as simplistic as a man and a woman. Mm. 
Yeah, because it really, again, it's, it's almost parts of the self too, isn't it's it? It's all parts of the self. Yeah, That's the whole point. And the, that... the masculine is coming in to represent that part of herself. Exactly. Um, which I don't think is, is, is clearly understood um, you know, in terms of our interpretation, you know, generally of those kinds of No, films. I totally agree. It's like a revelation and I would really love our daughters to grow up with that version of fairy tales that fairy tales are all about the heroine's journey, the journey mm. of self discovery, of having courage, which is to not necessarily be brave in a masculine sense, but to really sit with, you know, well, courage originally comes from the Greek word core, which means to speak one's mind from one's heart. So to be mm. courageous enough to own your story and to love those parts about yourself and find the gold in them and, and speak from a heart space is a knowing woman's mm, space. Mm. And you only get there through shedding those those layers or the, the life, death, life cycle. Yeah. I'd love to ask everyone who's listening, you know, sort of what is your view of the Disney kind of whole, I guess, entourage of films that explore these themes and you know where's that come from you know is it something that's a little bit negative is it something that's you know not is it not highbrow enough is it too mainstream is it too you know like trying to make our homogenize our children into you know all wearing Elsa dresses or you know mm. it, it, do you have a, a um a view on it like that because it's a real invitation this this exploration that we've just done here to look for the other side to see the the beauty in these stories and the mm. opportunity for conversation that it opens up with our children um as to how they might be able to explore their own challenges you know or you know where's the gifts in them where's the gifts in the hard stuff for them you and know? also where's the knowing of the intuition yeah where, intuition where's the, a big one where's the path for our girls to find their way back to their inner mm. knowing and inner guidance system mm. and here we have beautiful stories that can illustrate that that yeah. make our hard times seem hard but at the same time that we can sit with them and we can bear them and we can move through them mm. and I guess rather than labeling things you know around our kids as bad or you know we don't do that instead of it being a bit of an open conversation about you know how do you feel about that you know and, and those things that are coming up because there's just something to learn in everything that our kids are surrounded with and the, the, I guess the more we shut them off from those things that perhaps might be a little bit at odds with our own value system there's always so so much learning to be able to happen in that if we're having a conversation around it. That's exactly right. Mm. So I really hope that this brought some epiphany moments to you, maybe um, a smile or a tingle of a memory for you from your childhood. And I hope that it inspires you to reconnect with your wildish woman, with your instinctual self, mm. and find your blessings and your gifts in your creativity. So you can connect with us through facebook.com slash nourishing the mother or Bridget through suburbansandcastles.com. And you have a movie night I do. I've got a couple coming up. In September, we've got The the Connection, which is all about the mind-body connection. And in October, it's called there's a film called The Empowerment Project, which is very, very um, current for this topic that we're talking about, which is really about um, helping girls and women to really awaken their um, their kind of true selves and travel a path of often unconventional careers and, you know, really look at the lives of women and, and the choices that they're making in terms of what awakens them um, in their purpose. It's going to be a really great celebration of um, being a female. So mm, I love that. Mm. And you can connect with me for soul sessions on naturopathicbirth.com.au. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.